Well, that was a great introduction to the AGM. Thanks very much for that. Um, we, having the AGM of the British Association of Local History, I have on my right Ian Taylor, who's the treasurer, and on my left I have Paul Dryberg, who is the chairman, or the acting oh, yes. chairman. Yes. Acting yes. chairman. Yes. Uh, and I'm the president, which means I do nothing but watch what everybody else does. Uh, we have apologies for absence, which we've recorded, mm -hmm. and we will record those in the minutes. Uh, you've seen, I hope, the minutes, uh, you've been reading them every night for the last week, uh, of the last annual general meeting. They were in local history news. And uh, for, can I first say, is everybody happy with those minutes? Are there any corrections that need to be made to them? There are. There are corrections. They've Indeed. been noted. Uh, yeah. You would, I, I, I do can, you have to say what they are? I, well, I don't think we need to, but I will correct them. Uh, just to say, we did have the online vote and of the votes that were recorded, 36 people approved the minutes and nine people abstained on the grounds they weren't at the meeting, so, right. which I think is a reasonable reason to abstain. Well, that, that's more people voting in favour than I, usual, isn't but it? But I have yeah. recorded my error in the minutes. Okay. It's my fault, as always. Okay, so we take the minutes and we can, I don't know if those get signed, but they will mm, be added yeah. to the record. So we move on to item three on the agenda. Do you all have a copy of the agenda for today? But the, the third item is a report from the chair of the trustees, who is Dr. Paul Dryberg on my left. Paul. Thanks, Caroline. Um, so, welcome everybody. Welcome to everybody online. Um, I should report really, because this is the 2021 report, and I assumed responsibility for the day-to-day -day management of the association in July last year, when our then chair, Dr. Jessica Lutkin, took a break from the leadership role Jessica then formally resigned, both as chair and a trustee, in December 2021, due to ongoing health issues. I personally, I think the trustees and Caroline will agree, we all want to pay tribute to Jessica's vision, yeah. her dedication and her drive in devising, promoting and helping to deliver some of the exciting changes that you're witnessing today and hopefully will witness and have witnessed and will witness in the future. And also in some of the changes in the association's governance at a time of, obviously, as we've all experienced, continued flux and uncertainty. And I'd also like to offer my own personal thanks to her for support in the second half of last year and then into 2021. And I'd also, from my own personal point of view, also like to pay tribute to the uh, support, ingenuity, and just sheer hard work of my fellow trustees, officers, committee members, and contracted staff, many of whom are in the room or in the green room or online with you today. Um, well, I think we, we hopefully, you'll agree, continue to offer excellence in publications and a tangible boost to how the association has been engaging with members and non-members alike in the last two years. I would also like, with obviously great sadness amongst the trustee body, to report the passing in 2021 of Dr. Margaret O'Sullivan, who was our former treasurer and trustee of the association as well as that of Professor David Diamond, who is a former chair, vice chair and vice president. I think Caroline yes. agreed with that. Yeah. They were and have been crucial to yes. the, uh, the development of the association over many years. Uh, while she's sitting next to me, not, not because she's sitting next to me, I also want to uh, <laughs> note my own personal gratitude for the enduring presence, insight, and advice of Professor Caroline Barron, who is, as she says, the president, and she's eagerly encouraged all of the new initiatives of the association and has even led some herself, though she wouldn't, I'm sure, admit to that here, and as we've all had to adapt to new ways of working. Okay, so that's the love in over, and then to report what else has been going on. <laughs> so, obviously, the last two years, we've all know the radical changes that have happened in society as well as to the association. All bar the most recent issue of the local historian, which is our flagship journal, remains free to access online after the removal of the paywall, and that's still the case. Local History News, uh, with that, our, our publications continue to deliver the high quality research, reviews, and news about all things local history that members wanted to ensure continued in our survey and will continue to um, offer. Uh, we're hoping, and we continue to develop new publications, and I would like to pay testament, some, two of them at least are in the room, to Dr. Alan Crosby, who's the editor of The Local Historian, Dr. Jane Howells, who is the editor of Local History News, and Dr. Heather Falvey, who's the reviews editor in local, The Local Historian, for their input to our publications. They are amazing people and do amazing things for local history.
I was going to report about Mark's new manorial record of volume, but I don't need to now, as we've mentioned that, we've heard about it. But I should just say that we've got further multi-author uh, publications lined up for sources relating to interwar local history and migrant communities that are currently in development and, about, and a, a number of other things on our publishing suite. Now, turning to the digital offering, which I hope many of you have enjoyed and will, if you haven't, will join us, um, the pace really accelerated in 2021 and again, it's accelerating today. So you will know, hopefully, that our digital online offering are offered at discounted rates, both for members and members of member societies. Um, our social media fellows, Dr. Daniela Gonzalez to last July and Megan Kelleher to um, at the moment, they've grown our social media offering across all of the main platforms and have allowed us to share new online content and engage the association in online discussion and growth of local history in new audiences and communities. We've also developed a podcast series, which was developed by a first digital fellow, Dr. Claire Kennan, and that included um, such podcasts as National Records, Local History in the 1921 Census, and Community Archives and Local History. Um, a new series is currently being developed. I think, I think Megan, she won't confirm because she's doing something else, has got them in the can already for this year, so look out for those. We've also, and I hope you've enjoyed these as well, developed some digital skills webinars. So for example, um, Dr. John Chandler and Heather Falby um, ran a how to publish webinar, which was very successful. I think we had about 300 people attend that online with some really stimulating uh, um, debate. We've also had how to publish your local history. Oh, sorry, we've had that, sorry. The pleasures and pitfalls of researching disability history, for example. Local History Hour, which is our monthly online lecture series, has become a mainstay now of our uh, local history research offering online, attracting some large audiences. For those of you that don't join us on the last Thursday of the month, our speakers are drawn from academia, the cultural heritage sector and beyond, and they've introduced the key sources for a wide variety of topics such as women's lives in early modern documents, national mapping in the 19th and 20th centuries, and church wardens accounts, and they've interspersed those with some um, original archival research. Now, last December, I was fortunate to be part of the organisation or team for a, uh, an online conference, a more academic bent, as a tribute to Dr. Dennis Mills, who was one of the country's leading local historians who actually sadly died in 2020, and that was in association with the Society for Lincoln History and Archaeology and the Survey of Lincoln, as well as the Lincoln Record Society. And it, it continued our sort of online academic offering and was a, a, another stimulating conference which attracted um, a nice range of speakers. Now, although these aren't reports for 2021, I should just like to draw your attention to our lecture program with the Historic Towns Trust. So we held a four lecture series last February and March, um, which shared some really interesting new research and how to do research into historic towns and historic mapping. Um, with expert lecturers, and we've already booked a new series for 2023, so there will be a new Historic Trans Trust Lecture Series coming next year. Um, we are hoping, this is our first, first in-person event for two years, but thanks to the agency of Susan Moore and Adrian Webb, another of our trustees, we're hoping to hold an on, on in-person only conference in Taunton in, on the 8th of October, so those of you from the southwest of England, or who want to get to Taunton, will uh, be able to experience, uh, hopefully, another in-person conference, COVID willing, I guess, and also rail strikes willing, yeah. sadly. And then just finally, because obviously this follows on from Mark's talk, the Memorial Documents Register, which, as Mark mentioned, is being completed and launched this summer, they are hoping to, well, they are, they are hosting a conference on the 6th of September at the University of Nottingham, and the association has just agreed to sponsor some bursaries for some of the early career research um, contributors to that. So we will be having a presence there, and hopefully there will at least, I think, be a recording of the event made available on the Manorial Documents Register website with the National Archives. One final innovation from 2021 was our first annual winter lecture, which was designed as an accessible but rigorously researched exploration of a key topic. So this year, last year, sorry, it was held on the 9th of September, and we welcomed over 200 attendees to hear Professor Andrew Hopper, who's Professor of Local and Social History in the Department of Continuing Education at Rooley House, University of Oxford, speak on the human costs of the British Civil Wars. And the winter lecture was designed and dedicated to the memory of Professor David Diamond, who I mentioned was our recently deceased former Vice President and Vice Chairman. We are currently in negotiations with a prospective speaker for this December 
So look out for adverts for that. It will be online again this December. Finally, from me, I should say that the trustees believe that the association continues to run effectively and according to the constitution and the rules of its charitable status. We're constantly paying attention to finding ways and methods for the association to function more effectively in reaching a larger constituency of people interested in local history. And I'll be returning to those later. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. And I should say that, you know, without Paul's ability to step in and take over when Jessica was ill, the, I think the BALH would be in a much worse position. You've done a fantastic job, Paul, in keeping the ship sailing on. And you, we're all much in your debt. Thank you very much. So, and we're also, I suppose, we do need finance for what we do. Yes, and do. so uh, the report from our uh, treasurer, uh, Dr Ian Taylor, is important. So perhaps you'd like to tell us how we're doing. Uh, thank you, Caroline. That's uh, great. Uh, nice to be with you, uh, with us in person after three years. I can't believe it's three years since we mm -hmm. sat in this room and did this, but here we are. Um, now, the numbers. Um, I hope that everybody has a copy of the um, uh, uh, Statement of Financial Activities for the year ended 31st of December. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to pages 7 to 9, which is what I'm going to talk about. Um, no, I don't think I don't they, are, they haven't been distributed. They nobody printed them in. Nobody print, they were distributed by email. We'll believe you. But Go we'll on. believe you. So they, people, they have been distributed people, by yeah, email. Members have seen them. Yeah, yeah, yes, by members, have, members we, have seen we've them. Because we've had votes on the, on the accounts. So. Yes, Mem members have seen them by email. Well, the two of us here, we have never seen them, so I can't believe you voted this Well, we've had, we've had sufficient votes that we know, we know they went to members. So. Mm. Sorry. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Keep going. <laughs> I'll do my Keep best. Going. I'll do my best. Um, the key thing that jumps out of the numbers is that um, last year we made a, um, a surplus of over 15,000. This year, or oh, sorry, 2020 we made a surplus of over 15,000. 2021 we made a loss of nearly 3,000. That's an adverse movement of over 18,000 pounds. Why is that? And that is the key issue. Um, you'll see that on page seven, the, um, about two thirds of the way down, net income and expenditure. Um, and the um, Majority, the vast majority of that adverse movement uh, results from our um, digital investment and uh, teacher fellowship um, costs. You'll be hearing about the teacher fellowship later, so I won't go into that. But um, if you look at um, um, the, on page eight, uh, under the governance and support costs, you'll see the Digi digital engagement fellowship and social media fellow. Uh, they, that, 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 that amount compared to last year um, that's a, a, a net increase of over £10,000. We paid a Zoom subscription of £1,000, webinar lectures of uh, nearly £2,000 expended on that. Um, that's total um, um, web expenditure, digital expenditure of 13800 Having said that, and it was the beginning, we made a significant income, which you'll see on page 7 under the um, uh, digital events under um, uh, the uh, income. Uh, at the bottom of the income column. So that's, that, that, that means we made a, dig, a digital loss, uh, well, 13,000 less 6,300, digital loss of about 7,500 pounds. That's, that's the majority of the, um, of, the, of the shortfall. Plus, we spent nearly 7,000 pounds on the teacher fellowships. Uh, we had additional website increases of, of 1,100 pounds, and bank charges um, increased by 1,600 pounds, which um, concerned me so much, I, I actually looked at that in a bit more detail. Um, and uh, again, uh, it's slightly horrifying to see that. So bank charges themselves are £400. Stripe, and we're using Stripe a lot for, um, um, uh, for um, in increasing the receipts that we get for various digital um, activities. That's £1,000. And direct debit costs, well, the, the banks like um, taking money for direct debits, and that's another £1,000. So that is, that is, that is basically it. Um, that, that gets us to over £17,000 of the shortfall. Um, obviously, nobody likes to uh, make any kind of loss um, of the, of the, of the um, uh, £2,800. But if, if you turn over to page 9 and look at the balance sheet, the BLLH has net current assets of uh, nearly £120,000. So this is what we've done is we've invested money 
for the benefit of our members, and Paul's been talking about the digital stuff that's been going on, I'm just talking about what that costs. And we think that represents good value. It's certainly the way that the world is working, the way that's turning, the way that things are going forward. And we are investing for our members, both in digital activity and in the teacher fellowships. That is, that is what's caused the loss. Um, this year, in terms of, in terms of as, as public companies would say, turning to current trading, uh, we seem to be doing OK. One of the ways that we measure this is looking at um, our, our member, just simply our memberships. And um, our individual memberships have gone up dramatically, um, mainly through our increased activities and social media, which has brought in many new students. And um, obviously, during the pandemic, a lot of societies, um, um, well, they couldn't meet, so what's the point in, 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 uh, in, in doing anything? And so a lot of societies ceased to be members. I'm very glad to say that many of these societies are um, uh, returning in droves. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very encouraging that um, membership numbers are, I don't think they're quite where they were before the pandemic struck, but the curve is very much in the right direction. So that's where we are. Um, the, 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 the BALH is, um, uh, it is highly solvent. We have cash in the bank to invest for members. We're doing that, as Paul's been um, identified, and we, thoroughly, we fully intend to do that more and more and more as resources allow um, for, for the rest of this year and going forward. And um, I can say no more, but uh, I'll take any questions if people have got them. Well, thank you, Ian, very much. I... Oh, Caroline, I, I probably should formally report for Ian's benefit and for everybody else's benefit that the, the online vote for this, 42 votes approved the accounts. There were three abstentions. Three abstentions, right, so OK. we didn't get anybody with any questions either, so... Oh, right, OK, all right. But are there any questions from the floor? Has anybody got any questions for Ian? I have to say I'm, I'm going to adopt that phrase adverse movement, mm, yeah. meaning going into debt. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's a, splen I, I, it's a splendid I, I, euphemism, yeah. Caroline. Yes, I think it's a, a useful one. I'm going to, um, right, but I mean, we have, it's very good of you, Ian. You keep, a good, you keep us mm. on track, mm. you, and you make sure we don't spend money that we, we don't have. Or that I can be very mean. I can you be can very be quite mean, mean but yeah. he, it, it's hard work being our treasurer, and, and we're very lucky to have someone mm of Ian's quality to look after us. So thank you very much, Ian. Yeah. And um, yeah, please keep at it. <laughs> right, OK. Shall we move on now to the item five on the agenda, which is to elect the members of the Board of Trustees. And you will have seen on your... I should all have those. They should be you should all have them. But I'm going to read out the names just in case, because uh, I would like to propose that we elect those on block. And I think somebody from the floor probably should propose that we do that. The names that we have before us are Dr. Katie Bridger, Dr. John Chandler, Dr. Paul Dryberg, Dr. Jane Golding, Professor David Killingray, Dr. Tim Lomas, Dr. Jonathan Mackman, Ms. Susan Moore, Mr. Joe Saunders, Dr. Jack Southern, Dr. Ian Taylor, and Dr. Adrian Webb. Those are the proposed trustees. Would somebody from the floor be willing to propose that? Jane. Okay. And a seconder? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. I'm... Yeah, oh, sorry, yes, I could see now. Yes, okay. Um, right. Can I make yes. a comment on that? Sorry. You may. Uh, to, for those of you that saw the local history news, uh, for the original um, trustees nomination list, it is different from what's been submitted today. I can explain that. So, Dr. Jill Draper had at that point accepted. Uh, my offer to become a trustee since when she's felt that she would like to decline the offer, which is fine. Dr. Virginia Brainbridge has formally tendered her resignation in the interim too. And in an exercise undertaken by my colleague, Dr. Jonathan Mackman in April, we discovered, uh, we, we asked your forgiveness during COVID on this one, that both Professor Claire Cross and Dr. Winifred Stokes we found to have exceeded their statutory period in office as a trustee by one year during lockdown. So they've both obviously stood down, but they were originally in the list. Both Claire and Wynne will continue to sit on the publishing committee and will be eligible for re-election in one year. And I'd obviously like to, I think Caroline and Ian yeah. would agree, pay tribute to their contributions over yeah. the years in a variety of roles. So the online voting, Caroline, we've already had pros and seconder, yeah. 42 approved, three abstained. 
I should, however, say we did have somebody questioning the academic bias of our trustee line, as in it was skewed towards academics. Um, what I would like to do now, for those of you in the room and online, I'd like to make an offer to you all, those of you that are, represent member societies particularly, we're particularly looking for representatives of local history societies to join the trustee body. So do speak to me, do speak to Susan Moore, to Caroline, anybody, or yeah. send us off on chat. Obviously, we can't see the chat at the moment, but if somebody wants to put your details in chat, do let us know. We actively want to engage you and have representatives from local member societies as part of the trustee body to find out intimately what's going on out there, would how it, we can influence. Would it be worth just explaining what the commitments of a trustee would be, Paul? Indeed, well, I can yeah. do, yeah, yes. although we are just running please. short of time. But I, so, so we have um, four meetings a year, mm -hmm. all of which, bar one, are virtual at the moment, and then obviously the um, AGM. Yeah. Trustees, we do expect, where possible, to have an active role, whether it be in organising events, helping to run events, proposing events, um, joining our committees. Yeah. So we, we'd like, we'd like you to be active and to you know, come up with ideas and to reflect your own members' needs, wishes and desires. And it looks almost as if, since both Claire Cross and Wynne Stokes left, we need north of England. We do, indeed. Yes. yes, so if you come from the north of England, you're particularly Although welcome. Kate, Katie is probably waving at us from, from Newcastle as we okay, speak. Okay, Right, well, thank you very much. Shall we move on, then, to elect the officers of the Board of Trustees? Um, it is proposed that Paul should be the chair, the vice chair should be Dr Jane Golding and Mr Joe Saunders, and the treasurer should be Ian Taylor. Uh, I think we should have a proposal from the floor. Is somebody willing to propose those four officers? Right. Heather? Yes, Jane. Right, Heather. And seconded? Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, we now have item seven, the membership report and subscriptions. Uh, this is normally, this is written by Jonathan Mackman, but yeah. Paul is going to deliver the report. Right. Yes, yeah, so we didn't want too many of us on stage. Uh, <laughs> contrary to what Ian has just said, I think, our current overall membership now stands at 2,193, which according to Jonathan is the highest it's been over the last few years for which we've got figures, and possibly the highest ever. Obviously, numbers have fluctuated over the last two years due to the pandemic, but society membership, which fell significantly during COVID, as Ian says, because of the insurance, lack of need for the insurance, is now almost back to pre-pandemic levels, despite various groups pausing activities or even, in some cases, ceasing them altogether. The number of institutions subscribing to our journals has also bounced back, but the biggest change is in our individual and student membership, which has risen by around a third over the last two years, from a little over 700 to almost 1,000. And that's almost certainly been driven by our increased online presence over the past two years, and particularly things like the Skills Workshop and Local History Hour, which have proved extremely popular. So we'd like to thank everyone involved in producing such wonderful content for us. Uh, this year, 133 new members have joined in the last three months alone, and overall membership is up 10% on this point two years ago, which I think is an amazing testament mm -hmm. to what we've been doing, but also to Jonathan as well, who's actually mm -hmm. created the online directory of membership and is really kind of driving our recruitment as well. So subscriptions from our members form the overwhelming majority of our income, and without this we wouldn't be able to provide the range of activities we're currently offering. So a huge thank you to all of our members, and we hope you continue to enjoy your membership uh, as much as you can. Right, thank you very much. Are there any questions or suggestions? If you have suggestions about how we might enlarge our membership, and uh, do speak to any of us uh, while we're having lunch and so on afterwards. I'm sorry, Caroline, I should have said, because this is also about subscriptions, um, we are not proposing any changes to subscriptions for 2022-23. Well, I'm sure there'll be objections from the floor to that. <laughs> well, they might want it to go lower, Caroline. Yeah. Don't encourage. <laughs> right, OK. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. And then we come on to a report from the Fellowships and Outreach Coordinator. In, yeah, I mean, it's the outreach and the new officers we've appointed which are largely responsible mm. for our increased subscriptions and membership. Indeed, anyway, that's can me, you like to report? Me again, on? sorry. Um, so obviously in tw August 2021, those of you online will be able to, will already know that Megan is our new um, social media fellow. Megan's currently a PhD student at the University of Kent and a researcher for the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. She's brought us a, a whole new dynamic suite of activities. She's become the face of our online uh, yeah. programme. 
she took over from Daniela Gonzalez, as I've said. Um, one, in the recruitment progress for Megan's role, there was one of the outstanding candidates who you'll have seen around the room in her lovely suit today. Um, so we encourage the trustees to sanction the creation of a new role. Uh, Catherine Waugh is our new engagement fellow, and she's tasked with coordinating our engagement with new audiences, both online and, hopefully, increasingly in person. And so she's actually led the way in creating new video content. In November last year, we also recruited Stephen Miller as our new outreach coordinator, who from this January has started to begin streamlining the management of our offer across publications, in-person events, online program, and our local history day today. Now, Stephen steps into the uh, formidably brilliant shoes of uh, Dr. Jill Draper, who has for over 15 years acted as the association's events and development officer. And now Jill, as many of you will know, many of you will have met her at events. Mm -hmm. She's worked tirelessly to promote the association nationally, often writing important articles and giving research lectures at major events, as well as just attending them on our behalf. Yep. Uh, she also actually devised the innovative 10-minute talks feature on our website at the beginning of lockdown. And I know the trustees uh, wish to express their thanks and admiration for all Jill has done for the association. And I should say that, well, I'll, I'll, I'll spoil her now. There will be a short video tribute to Jill later on this afternoon. Right, thank you. Any, any questions about these new officers that we have? But they do amazing work, and they are the sort of public face of the trust and have done such a good job. And, and of course, Jill as well, but we'll be speaking about Jill later. Um, okay, we move now to item nine, uh, local history survey update, which... Yeah, I'm afraid this is a mea culpa or nostra yes. culpa on this one. So I would like to note that obviously the progress we, we would like to have seen with pro processing the survey results in 2021 has been kind of hampered, unfortunately, by Jessica's illness and then resignation because it was Jessica who had taken the lead in analysing the survey. So I'm begging your uh, forgiveness for the lack of a more concrete update. But actually, I would like to note that the fluidity of the current situation, as kind of witnessed by our response today and other cognate events out there, means that the conclusions we were hoping to draw are going to be slightly muddied in future by just the, the fluidity of, of what's happening in the world and how that's affecting yeah. all sort of societies, been overtaken in events. effect by, Indeed. by lockdown and all but that we've done. Yeah. I will say the main message that emerged from the survey is just the liveliness of local history communities and how innovative people are and finding new... And I think we're going to hear from some of the award winners later about what they've been doing uh, locally. Right. OK. Thank you very much. So, uh, And finally, the Teacher Fellowship Programme. Yep. update, which Tim Lomas is really in charge of that, but you're Indeed. giving it for him. I am, sorry, Tim does send his apologies, um, and I, I will give his report in full. So, um, Tim, who's led the, the Teacher Fellowship Programme in association with the Historical Association, um, reports that having survived the challenges of COVID, it's now nearing completion. Twelve teachers, six from primary and six from secondary, have gone through an application process, a residential session and a training programme. They've identified resources for schools and are producing those resources for use in schools. And they should hopefully represent some of the best practice there is in local history for school children of different ages. Now, final stage yet to come is to edit those resources and make them available on both our website and their, of the Historical Association. Now, it's been agreed that the participants, as well as earning the title Teacher Fellow, will be available to support either the BLHA or HA at talks and conferences. And a huge thanks is owed to many people who have contributed, but especially to the two lead tutors, Bev Forrest for primary and Michael Riley for secondary, and to both Tim himself and Dr. Claire Kennan, who was involved at the start for the BALH. Now, they've all reinforced the fact that it's been a most rewarding and positive experience, and they've been fortunate to work with such dedicated and enthusiastic professionals. Now, the local history themes were listed in the last local history news, but in summary, they range widely geographically and embrace people, places and events. So they include, for example, a street in Sheffield, an area of York, black country in wartime, that kind of thing, for primary. And then for secondary, they cover such local figures in Bristol and Liverpool, radicalism in Stroud, and a change in Cambridge Street. So there's a wide variety of uh, material there. The intention is that these should act as a stimulus for other teachers to model, refine and develop the history of their particular communities. And the association will be observing the continued development in schools and hopefully advise and publish these future resources. If nothing else, fostering even greater interest in teaching and learning local history in schools. It's a very successful project, isn't it? Mm, and so. Very exciting, the mm. things that they seem to be yeah, doing with absolutely. kids in schools. 
Okay. Uh, any questions about that? And if so, perhaps we should pass them on to, to Indeed. To yeah, we Tim. can pass any questions on. All right. We move to item 11, which is the appointment of the independent examiners for our accounts. I think you have proposed... Yes, I would propose that we uh, reappoint um, um, uh, more... More South, I think they're now called. They're not yeah. More Stevens anymore. No, no, no they, they've, they've changed their name to More South for reasons. More really South. Known. More yeah. South, yes, less yeah. known to them. They used to be More Stevens. Um, uh, the, we, we've, we have, they've, they've done a good job for us for many years, so I think that they should be rewarded by re, be reappointed. So I propose them. Okay. okay. And online, we had 41 votes approving that and four abstentions, <laughs> probably because they thought they were More Stevens. More South. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. Well, that's overwhelming support for that appointment. Thank you, Ian. Is there any other business that anyone would like to bring up at this AGM? 